All right, so in this lecture, um, I'm going to talk about some methods that are known as kernel methods. And these are methods that allow us to really um, scale things when we work with generalized linear models. Okay, so if you recall, um, earlier we talked about linear models, and then one approach to work with nonlinear models was just to say, let's come up with a mapping phi that takes our data from the original space and maps it to, into a new space using a nonlinear mapping, and then we'll simply do linear algebra into our, our new space. Right? And then by virtue of the mapping being nonlinear, then any linear function in a new space is implicitly nonlinear with respect to the original space. So we're going to see various methods that will help us um, scale this. And in particular, there's this notion of kernel that will lead to a trick where whenever we come up with a mapping and we go to a higher dimensional space, we won't have to pay a price with respect to that larger space, because that is one of the drawbacks of those techniques. OK, so let's start by doing just a quick recap of some of the uh, similarities and differences between generalized linear models and neural networks. OK, so for generalized linear model, the main thing is that you work with fixed nonlinear basis functions. And because these basis functions are fixed, then our hypothesis space is limited. So that's obviously a drawback, but then there's a good side to this as well, which is that the optimization tends to be easier. And here, the optimization is usually going to be convex. OK, so again, it's this trick where we come up with a mapping phi to take our data into a new space. Now, when we take our data into a new space, um, we're coming up with a nonlinear function, and, and that's what's going to define what can be fitted. Uh, so we need to essentially have um, a reasonable number of basis functions that capture the different types of nonlinearities that we might encounter. And, and then the problem is that uh, those basis functions are fixed. So as a result, the hypothesis space is limited. But then because they're fixed, uh, the optimization is going to be easy. So usually, we end up, again, doing linear algebra. And then the optimization tends to be convex. OK, now in comparison, we can also look at neural networks. So in this case, we have adaptive basis functions, by adaptive nonlinear basis functions. And the fact that those basis functions are adaptive comes from the fact that we have some weights inside the basis functions that we can optimize, that we can vary. So they're not fixed, right? So they can change as a result. And then this will, um, I guess, increase um, our hypothesis space. So, so we have a richer hypothesis space. So this is a good thing, but then the drawback is that it's going to be harder to optimize. And usually, 
the optimization is non-convex. OK, so what we've got on the board here is essentially a summary of the main characteristics of two of the most important paradigms in machine learning. So generalized linear models were essentially the most important paradigm up until 2010. And part of the reason was because um, we wanted to do optimization effectively, and then we could do it easily. So there was a lot of emphasis on doing convex optimization. And then the fact that we had the limited hypothesis space was not a big deal because back then, the amount of data that we had was not very large. I mean, the amount of data was always increasing, but it still wasn't that large. And, and then so it wasn't um, a, a big limitation. But then uh, roughly, um, well, starting in 2009 and then all in, into the 2010s, neural networks really took over. So this was the uh, era of deep learning that we're still in. And then um, the big difference is that now we have a lot of data, a lot of computational power. And, and then so having a richer hypothesis space um, allows us to fit better models, to have better solutions. Um, we still have trouble doing the optimization, but then um, we've made some progress and at least um, you can see through um, some frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch that we can optimize some very large neural networks. Um, the optimization is still far from perfect, but we, can, we, we obtain better results than before. Okay, so, so yeah, so then having a richer hypothesis space became more important, and that's in part why today neural networks are the dominant paradigm. Any questions regarding this? OK, very good. All right, so when we consider generalized linear models, then we have to come up with some basis functions. And then as we saw, the hypothesis space is limited because we have fixed basis functions and, and we're just going to have to come up with them ahead of time. So if we don't want to have a, a hypothesis space that is too limited, then perhaps what we can do is just consider a large number of basis functions and maybe even an infinite number of basis functions. So if we want to do that, then there's an obvious problem because computationally, if it's large or even infinite, how are we going to do this tractably? Right? So there's going to be a cost computationally for that. Well, it turns out that there is a trick um, known as the dual trick, or otherwise the kernel trick, where what we can show is that the complexity of the computation does not have to depend on the number of basis functions that we have, but instead we can make it depend on the amount of data that we have. So for low data regimes, then uh, these techniques can be quite effective because then you can map your data into a large um, space, inf even an infinite space, and, and then the, the cost will not depend on the dimensionality of the new space, but instead on the amount of data that, that we have. So if you have just a little bit of data, then the cost won't be too high. Okay, so this is enabled by this dual trick or kernel trick that we're gonna see in a moment. And some examples of these techniques include Gaussian processes. We're going to talk about this next class and also support vector machine the following class. Uh, but then essentially all the techniques that we saw for generalized linear models, whether it's for classification or regression, we can use this kernel trick and then um, we'll be able to essentially work into high dimensional spaces without paying a cost. Okay, so what is this kernel trick? Um, it relies on this notion of a kernel function. So here, we've already talked about the mapping phi that is essentially a set of basis functions that map our inputs into a new feature space. All right, so we've got our original space, and then we define some basis functions through a mapping phi that takes our data into a new space using some nonlinear functions. Now, it turns out that in many algorithms, 
when we do this and we are working into this new space, the computation that we would do in the new space is always of the form phi of x transpose phi of x prime. So in other words, uh, most of these algorithms, the computation is going to boil down to some dot product between pairs of points into the new space. So this is quite interesting because if it's always a dot product of pairs of points, then maybe we could find ways of accelerating or making the cost of computing those dot products a lot cheaper, and then all of these algorithms could scale better. Okay, so let's call these dot products, uh, or I guess we're going to rename them with um, the notion of a kernel function. So here, k of x, x prime is just going to be the dot product between two points, x and x prime, but into our new space. Okay, so that's why it's phi of x transpose times phi of x prime. <clears throat> okay, so now if we happen to know what is the, the output of this kernel function for every pair of points, then we don't need to know anymore what is the underlying feature space defined by phi of x, and we don't have perhaps to pay any price in terms of computation with respect to phi of x. So the key is going to be to show first that all of these algorithms, they do computation um, where there's this dot product. We're going to rename it and just call it k of x, x prime. And then after this, we're going to show that uh, we can define some kernel functions that are very fast to, um, to evaluate and do not require um, explicit computation with phi of x. Okay, so as an example, let's go back to linear regression and then let's see what happens um, in terms of the computation. So first we're going to see that all of our computation is in terms of phi transpose phi and, and then we're going to rename this as a kernel and then we'll see that we can define kernels where the computation is independent of the dimensionality of the space. Okay, so for linear regression, this was our objective. If you recall, we're minimizing squared loss and then we're also minimizing uh, the Euclidean norm of the weights which you can think as, as a, a regularizer. Okay, if we expand this, um, like, I guess to, to, to optimize this, what we did is we simply took the derivative, uh, the gradient, set it to zero, and which gave us this expression. And now, instead of isolating w, right, before what we did is was just isolate w so we can find what the solution is, I'm going to rewrite this expression a little bit differently. I'm going to write it as w is equal to some expression here times phi of x. And here I'm not isolating w completely because I've got w on, on the right side and then w on the left side. That's fine. But the point of this expression is that now I can show that w is really here a linear combination of phi of xn. Phi of xn is essentially each data point xn into my new space. And what I'm showing is that my weight vector, my solution, is really a linear combination of my data points into the new space. And the reason I'm saying it's a linear combination is because I can think of everything in parentheses here as just a coefficient that multiplies uh, my, my basis here. Okay, so, so this is just, um, uh, a reorganization of the expression, right? but again the key is that now you see we have a linear combination, these are coefficients times phi of xn. Okay, so now based on this, what we can do is substitute w with another expression that I'm going to call phi times a, and here this is a, a capital phi that corresponds to the matrix of all my points into the new space. Okay, so, um, yeah, actually, okay, I've, I've got phi defined here. So you see phi of x1 is essentially my first data point in my data set that's now been mapped into my new space. 
right? And then 5x2 is again my second data point that's mapped into the new space. And now this matrix here is essentially the concatenation of all my data points into the new space. So it turns out that I can rewrite W as a linear combination of those um, uh, points into the new space. And I'm going to denote by A the coefficients of that linear combination. So essentially, this, this equation is just the matrix version of what I had on the previous slide right here. Okay, so here, you see I'm taking a linear combination. So this is essentially A times phi, which I just write in matrix form right here. Okay. So knowing this, now what we can do is simply say, well, why don't we treat A as a variable instead of W? Okay, because phi, this is just my data into the new space. So there's nothing to be optimized there that's given to us. Um, we just map the data into the new space. And then when I vary W, what I'm really doing is varying A. So I might as well consider A as a new variable. So I guess here the name dual trick comes from the fact that we can do the optimization into a different space, into the space of the variables that correspond to A as opposed to W. So, so here what's happening is that we have our data in some space, we have a mapping phi that takes us into a new space for the data, but also we have variables W where we did the optimization and instead we're going to map them into also a different space, a dual space, and then we're going to denote the new variables A. So A is really just, um, I, I guess, uh, an equivalent of W, but in a different space. Okay, so A is a vector in general, and then as we saw, A will implicitly correspond to this expression, right? So this comes from the previous slide, so uh, it's, it's this part here of the expression. So now I can take my original objective for linear regression that where I was minimizing W, and instead I can rewrite it in terms of minimizing A. So if I simply replace every W into my objective here, so this is my objective, I replace this W, this W, and this W by phi times A, I obtain this expression. Now when you look at this expression, you might not get it too inspired, right? It doesn't look very good. <laughs> it looks like there's just a bunch of phi's multiplied together and then more phi's and more phi's. So that's not too exciting. But uh, the beauty is that now when you look at this, it's always phi transpose phi, and then again phi transpose phi, and then here phi transpose phi, and finally phi transpose phi. So basically, the computation now with respect to the new space for the data is always where we take phi transpose phi between two data points. So that shows that in the case of linear regression, once we work into the new space, we're really doing always computation that correspond to dot products of pairs of points in, into the new space. Okay, so now with this, we've seen that we can rename our dot product with the notion of a kernel function. So I'm going to replace those phi transpose phi by k. So here, let me define k to be a matrix that corresponds to the product of phi transpose phi, where those phi's are matrices. Okay, so again, this was the definition of phi. Now, when I take these matrices and I multiply them together, I get a matrix again, and I'm going to call that the Gram matrix. But the Gram matrix is essentially just um, all my um, dot products between pairs of points into the new space. Okay, so I can simplify a little bit my objective, where I replace all those phi transpose phi by k. And now, if I simply want to find a solution, so in other words, find what is the A that minimizes this, I take the gradient, set it to zero, and I would arrive at this equation. Okay, so, so this gives us an alternative way of optimizing, of finding the solution. 
in terms of A instead of W. But now if I want to make a prediction, so let's say I've got an X star and I want to predict the output Y star. Normally, uh, if I have W, I would simply take a linear combination in this way. But now I can replace W by phi times A. And then I can uh, further expand this where I can replace A by this expression. So this would be the answer. Okay, so I can, I can essentially do uh, a prediction with the solution into this dual space in this manner. Okay, so this is all nice. Some of you might get excited. Some of you might feel like this is too much math. Uh, so what's the point of all that? Okay, so the point here is that when we do the computation into the dual space, we have a different complexity for the computation. The original optimization in the primal space with respect to W was dependent on the number of basis functions. Okay, so when I do the optimization with respect to, to W, I have a variable W for every basis function, so every dimension into my new space. So obviously the complexity depends on that. But once I work in the dual space and I work with A instead of W, then we can show that the complexity depends on the amount of data and not the dimensionality of the space. So this is very interesting because now it means we can go to very high dimensional space, in fact infinite dimensional space, and we won't have to pay any price because the computation will just depend on the amount of data. Okay, so how do we achieve this? So to have a complexity that just depends on the amount of data, we'll need a way to compute those kernel, um, specifically the gram matrix, without having to refer to the points in, into the new space. So here, in other words, I just need to define a kernel k, kernel function k, that allows me to find out what is all those dot products without actually computing the dot products. Okay, so it, it turns out that there are various ways in which we could define kernel functions that will implicitly correspond to dot products. We don't need to perform the dot products, we just need to know that there exists a way of computing the dot products, but then we'll simply work with the kernel function directly. Okay, so, so here, um, yeah, we, what we want is this uh, gram matrix K that corresponds to all the kernels. Um, we know it's phi transpose phi, but instead of first defining a mapping phi and then computing K, I'm going to specify K directly. And if I specify K directly, well, here it's not obvious, but there might be some functions that will be okay, there's going to be implicitly a corresponding phi and other functions that won't have a corresponding phi. Okay, so we need to be careful, we cannot just take an arbitrary function and then just declare that, oh, this is my k, this is my kernel. So we have to pick functions that uh, have an implicit correspondence with phi transpose phi. Okay, so those functions that will have an implicit correspondence um, essentially, they need to be positive semi-definite. So here, um, okay, if um, this is not a course about uh, linear algebra or optimization, but if you're familiar with this concept, right, um, so positive semi-definite matrices are, arise in, in all kinds of scenarios, and then they arise here as well, so, um, so the gram matrix needs to be positive semi-definite. So by definition, a matrix is positive semi-definite when it can be factored into one matrix phi that you can multiply by itself and, and then it, it gives us k again. Okay, so that's why uh, here it means that the gram matrix or the kernel function needs to be positive semi-definite. It just means that there must exist some matrix phi that you can multiply by itself. Uh, in terms of linear algebra, it's the same as well as saying that the gram matrix has eigenvalues that are all greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Um, all right, so, so now let's see uh, one example about how we could define a kernel directly and then we'll figure out 
after the fact, what is the corresponding mapping phi? The idea is that I'll be able to compute this kernel function without having to refer to phi, but the idea is that there exists an implicit phi, and, and then so in that sense it will be a valid kernel. Okay, so I'm going to consider x that is two-dimensional, so x1, x2, and z that is also two-dimensional, so z1, z2. Um, and now I'm going to define k of x, z to be equal to x transpose z square. Okay, so this is a, a kernel function that I'm defining, so I'm just going to take the dot product in the original space and square it. Okay, so this is uh, something arbitrary. And now the question is, is this a valid kernel function? In other words, does there exist some mapping that would allow me to go to some other space and then take a dot product in that space that would correspond to doing this? Okay, so if we expand this, then we would get here um, x1, z1 plus x2, z2 square. Um, I can expand this further. Then I'll get x1 square, z1 square plus 2x1, z1, x2, z2 plus x2 square, z2 square. And this is equal to now taking the dot product of x1 square, square root of 2, x1, x2, and x2 square times z1 square, square root 2, z1, z2, and z2 square. OK, so here, these are just uh, manipulations, um, little algebra. But then the point is that now, based on this, we can define um, phi 1 of x to be equal to x1 square. Phi 2 of x is equal to square root 2 x1, x2 and phi 3 of x is equal to x2 squared. Okay. So in other words, right, this is equal to phi of x transpose times phi of x. Okay, so normally you see we start with phi and then we would compute the kernel simply by conducting this dot product. But now in this case, what I've done instead is I just gave you a function, right? This function does the dot product in the original space, not the, uh, the new space. So if the new space is very large or infinitely large, it doesn't matter. I'm taking the dot product in my original space, and then I'm just squaring. And then it does correspond to taking the dot product into a new space that's defined with these basis functions. Yeah? Um, at the very bottom line, is it supposed to be phi of z for the Oh, yes. Very good. So yeah, this should be phi of z. OK. Okay, so with this example, you see, we did construct 
a kernel function directly and then the computation did not depend on, on the new space. In general, it turns out that we can construct lots of functions in, in this way and then because we construct them, we can construct them in a way where we're going to control their complexity. We're going to make sure that their complexity does not depend on, on the new space and their complexity can, can be very, uh, very small. Um, okay, so one idea for constructing kernels is that there are some basic rules that we can follow. So if I already have kernels, uh, then I can compose kernels to make more kernels that are valid. So here we have 10 rules where if I already have a kernel uh, k1 and then a second kernel k2 that are valid in the sense that there exists a mapping phi for each one of them, then I can compose them or at least I can construct new kernels where I can always just multiply by a constant that's positive here I can pre and post multiply by some function f uh, that's in terms of x and x prime. Um, I can take the exponential, I can take the sum, I can take the product, I can now take um, another kernel here. Um, so there's lots that, that we can do. Okay, so these are different rules that you can follow to essentially obtain new kernels out of some kernels because it's not always obvious when a function is a valid kernel. But once you've got a few basic building blocks, then you can compose them together to obtain uh, more complex kernels. Okay, so some of the common kernels that are used in practice, and this is in fact what you're going to have to code in an assignment tree, they include the polynomial kernel and uh, also the Gaussian kernel that we'll, we're going to talk about next. So the polynomial kernel is essentially a kernel where you take the dot product in the original space just like what I did in the example here and then you raise that to some power. So here if I raise this to power m I'm going to get a polynomial expression of degree m and then the feature space is in fact all the degree m products of entries in x. Okay so, so as a concrete example if x and x prime are two images, then the feature space could be all product of m pixel intensities together. Okay, so again, if, I, if we look at um, the example that I did on the board here, so here you see my power is two, so this would be the case where m is equal to two, and when I look at the implicit feature space, Right? It corresponds to monomial basis functions of degree 2. Right? Because x1 squared, that has degree 2. Here I've got x1 times x2, so this has degree 2. And then x2 squared, this has degree 2. In general, if you take the pr dot product in the original space, raise that to some power, power m, then you would end up with a lot of basis functions implicitly where all of those basis functions are going to correspond to monomials of degree m and then that would correspond to essentially different combinations of the input variables uh, such that when you take their product, the product is of degree m. Okay, so this is quite powerful because you see the number of basis functions is going to grow, so if I consider a power m here right, then I would have a lot more basis functions. In fact, it would be, um, I believe, exponential in, in M, so, so we would have a nice reduction in, in complexity because we're implicitly working into a large dimensional space, but then we do the computation in the original space. Okay, so let's stop here and then uh, we'll complete the slides uh, next class. All right, so last lecture I introduced kernels and then if you recall this is um, a special construction that essentially allows us to um, directly specify dot products between pairs of data points. And this is very useful uh, whenever we want to work with uh, the framework of generalized linear models. And normally in this framework, if you recall, 
we start in some space and then we come up with a mapping phi that's nonlinear that takes us to a new space and then we do our regression or classification using um, linear algebra or otherwise simple tools in that new space but then because the mapping was nonlinear in the first place then it means that whatever linear function we come up with in a new space is implicitly nonlinear in the original space. Okay, so this is all good. The problem that we saw is that whenever we go to this new space, if we want some flexibility, then the new space better have high dimensionality, right? So we need lots of basis functions, and then we're going to pay a price computationally. But then it turns out that using kernels, we can avoid paying this price. And the idea is that we notice that all of the computation boils down to dot products in that new space. Right, so the idea is that um, we can uh, represent with a kernel function. Uh, the kernel function is essentially the function that tells us in this new space what will be the dot product between pairs of points and an x prime. And now if we can specify this directly without having to go to the new space and performing the dot product there, then we can often save on computation and then often pay a price that's really just dependent on the dimensionality in the original space. Okay, so on this slide I've got a concrete example of a very common kernel known as the polynomial kernel. Um, so in its simplest form, it's essentially taking the dot product in the original space, so x transpose x prime, and then raising this to some power m. So here, um, uh, okay, so first I should say that this um, polynomial kernel is one that you guys will be playing with in, in assignment three. So you're going to get to, uh, to code this and understand better some of the properties. But I'm going to write on the board an example again of what this corresponds to. Okay, so just to keep things uh, concrete, so I'm going to use m equals two, and I'm also going to use x to be just a small vector of two dimension. So we're, we're going to expand this and see what this corresponds to. Okay, so if I define k of x, x prime to be um, x transpose x prime raised to the power of 2. And here for this uh, little example, I'm going to use x that is equal to x1, x2, and x prime which is equal to x1 prime, x2 prime. Okay? Uh, obviously, in practice, we want to consider vectors that are higher dimensionality, but just to keep the example simple, that's what I'm going to work with. Okay, so if I expand this, right, then I will get um, x1, x1 prime plus x2, x2 prime square. And then I can expand this further where I get x1 square, x1 prime square plus. 2x1, x1 prime, x2, x2 prime, plus x2 square, x2 prime square. Okay. And then I can rewrite this as x1 square, square root 2, x1, x2 x2 square times x1 prime square square root 2 x1 prime x2 prime and then x2 prime square. Okay, so this makes it clear. You see that when I take the dot product in the original space and then I square this, there is a corresponding dot product into a different space, and then it would be a three-dimensional space here, where the features would be x1 square, 
<coughs> square root 2, x1, x2, and then x2 square. OK, and now uh, the polynomial kernel is a generalization of this, where instead of having a power of 2, we have an arbitrary power, power m. And then the intuition is that when this generalizes, right, so here are all the features, whenever we've got power of 2, they correspond to essentially monomials of degree 2. And here a monomial is essentially one term uh, where we take the product of variables such that the degree of this product is 2. So you see this is degree 2, this is degree 2, and this is degree 2. So now if I erase this to the power of m, I'm going to have all the terms that correspond to monomials of degree m. So essentially I'm going to take features of my input vector, multiply them together, and essentially going to take m of those features and multiply them together. So this is going to be a vector of all combination of m possible features where some features might repeat. Okay, so then you can see that when you do that, looking at all possible combinations of m features where some of them repeat, this is going to be exponentially large in m, so it's a very high dimensional space. But then the beauty is that we're doing the computation in the original space, and then we just raise that to some power. So there's no real cost computationally to, to doing that. Any questions regarding this? OK, so now in practice, to understand, um, we could consider an example where, for instance, what if we take x and x prime to be images? OK, so if x and x prime are two images, then x would be essentially a vector of pixel intensities. It would already be a vector that is quite large. It might have you know, thousands of entries to millions of entries, depending on the resolution of the image. And now if we move that into um, our new feature space by taking x transpose x prime, raising this to some power, then we're going to essentially create new features that instead of being just single pixel intensities, is going to be the product of multiple pixel intensities. We think the product of essentially every combination of m pixels together where some pixels might, might repeat. Okay, so, so it's a much richer space. And obviously we could not do this um, with, with images if we take m to be fairly large because this, this would be like way too big. It would be exponential in m. Okay, but then the beauty is that now you see it gives us a, a richer space and then there's hope that in that richer space we might be able to um, find some function that is linear and implicitly nonlinear in the original space that captures the classes that we want or the, the curve that we want if, if, if we're doing regression. OK, so this works nicely if we want features in a new space that are of degree m. But now what about features of all degrees up to m? We can also obtain this very simply by modifying the kernel by adding simply a constant c. So here, if I do x transpose x prime and I add a constant c and then raise this to the power of m, this will have the effect of considering all features of degree up to m. So that means degree 0, degree 1, degree 2, all the way up to degree m. Okay, so just to make this concrete, I'm going to write on the board as well what this corresponds to, and this should become clear. So if I define my kernel to be x transpose x prime plus c square, uh, this will correspond to x1, x1 prime plus x2, x2 prime plus c square. I can expand this. I'll have x1 square, x1 prime square plus 2, x1, x1 prime 
x2, x2 prime plus x2 square, x2 prime square plus 2x1, x1 prime c plus 2x2, x2 prime c plus c square. Okay, so when I do the expansion like this, I get six terms. And now I can rewrite those six terms as a dot product. So I will get um, x1 square, square root of 2, x1, x2, um, x2 square. Then the square root of 2c, x1, square root of 2c, x2, and c. Okay, so I'm going to have this vector times another vector, x1 square, square root 2, x1 prime, x2 prime, x2 prime. Okay, so it's this vector times this vector. I should normally write the second vector as a column vector, but I can't do it on the board, so I'm just going to write it as a row vector transpose. Okay, uh, but we can see that it is again a dot product between two vectors. And now, if you look carefully, you see I've got degree two monomials, then degree one monomials, and finally degree zero. So I've got essentially all of the degrees of all possible monomials up to degree two. Okay, any questions regarding those two constructions? Okay, very good. All right, so this is the polynomial kernel. Now, there is another kernel that is quite popular, and it is known as the Gaussian kernel. And here, um, we've seen the Gaussian distribution, Gaussian basis functions, um, Gaussian potentials, and now we're talking about uh, Gaussian kernel. So the Gaussian formula is quite important for all kinds of reasons. Um, so here, if we have two data points, n x and x prime, we can uh, use a Gaussian formula to define a Gaussian, well, to define a kernel. It essentially follows the same formula as the Gaussian distribution, but here, again, this has nothing to do with the distribution. It just so happened that this formula can be used for that purpose. Um, okay, so here, I should mention that when we talk about kernels, right, so the kernel uh, is essentially the dot product in the new space, and then we can often represent that dot product with some formula that is faster to compute. Now intuitively, what is being computed by this dot product is some form of similarity. Okay, we can think of the kernel as measuring a form of similarity. So, Whenever we have two vectors and then we take their dot product, right? if the two vectors are parallel, you take their dot product, the dot product is going to be high. But if one vector is perpendicular to the other vector, you take their dot product and it's going to be zero. Right? So here we can think of the dot product as some sort of similarity measure in the new space. And here we're simply finding some shortcut about computing that similarity measure. And intuitively, you see, if we're going to do classification or we're going to do regression, but especially in the case of classification, it kind of makes sense that what would matter for us to come up with um, a separator would be uh, to uh, 
be able to um, tell which points are similar to each other and perhaps might be in the same class and which points might be different from each other and should be in different classes. Okay, so I guess one interpretation of the kernel is that it is some form of similarity measure and then this becomes um, intuitive when we look at the Gaussian kernel as well because you see if we have two points that are really identical then the difference here will be zero and then we're going to have um, essentially a, a value for the kernel that is high. Whereas if the two points are very far apart from each other then this difference is going to be large and then uh, the value of the kernel is going to vanish so it's going to be close to zero. Okay, so, so in general think of it as similarity or if you prefer some sort of distance measure, although it's not exactly a distance or a metric, but just some general notion of, of similarity. Okay, so now um, an interesting question is why is the Gaussian kernel a valid kernel? Okay, so here I'm claiming that it is a kernel and if you recall um, a function is a kernel as long as we can rewrite it as a dot product of two vectors in a new space. So here we could go through the, uh, the exercise of expanding this into whatever is the implicit feature space and then verifying that there's a dot product but it turns out that in this case it's going to be difficult because the feature space is infinite. Okay, so, so in fact for um, assignment three you have to prove that uh, the feature space is infinite and, and that will obviously make it difficult uh, for us to really just verify that there is a, a, a dot product between uh, I guess two sets of features. So here let's use a different strategy to verify that it is um, a valid kernel. And for this we're going to go back to the rules that we saw at the last lecture. All right, so the last lecture I talked about uh, how we can construct kernels that are sophisticated based on simple rules or simple, um, I guess, yeah, so, so, some simple building blocks and, and then these are the rules, uh, at least some of the common rules that can be used for that. All right, so if you recall uh, if I have two kernels K1 and K2 that are valid I can make new kernels by essentially just multiplying an existing kernel by a positive constant pre and post multiplying a kernel by some function uh, taking the polynomial of a kernel, the exponential of a kernel, adding two kernels, multiplying two kernels etc. Okay so now I'd like you to look at those rules and let's go back to our Gaussian kernel, what rules could we use to justify that this is a valid kernel? Okay, so if you look carefully, there's an exponential, then there's a minus, I'm going to take the Euclidean norm of x minus x prime and then divide by 2 sigma square. So if I'd like to, oops, if I'd like to justify that this is a, a valid kernel, so what rules in here would be relevant for this? Yes? Yes, okay, so rule number four is a good one to start because if we have a kernel already, we take the exponential, that's going to be a valid kernel. So here, um, oops, let me go back. No. So yeah, there we go, so we've got the exponential, so now we just need to show that what is in parentheses here is also a kernel. Any ideas what are other rules that we could use for that? Yeah? Dividing by 2 sigma squared plus multiplying by 2 sigma Yes, okay, so dividing by 2 sigma squared corresponds to multiplying by a constant. But if you notice though, there is a minus sign in front here. So that rule is useful, but uh, we'll need more than that. Okay, so to help you guys, let me expand this expression and then we'll uh, consider again the rules.
Okay, so we've got k of x, x prime, which is equal to e to the minus x minus x prime. So this is the Euclidean norm divided by 2 sigma square, like this. Okay, so I can rewrite this as e to the minus x transpose x divided by 2 sigma square times e to the x transpose x prime divided by sigma square times e to the minus x prime transpose x prime divided by 2 sigma square. Okay, so what I've done is essentially expand x minus x prime. If these guys are vectors, when I take the Euclidean norm, it translates into a term that is x transpose x, another term that is x transpose x prime, and then one last term that is x prime transpose x prime. Okay? And now those terms, I can separate them into different exponentials as follows. Okay? Okay, so now that we've got this expansion, um, let me go back here to the rules. So, okay, we know rule four is gonna be useful. We also know that rule one is gonna be useful. What other rule do you think we might use? Yeah. Ah, yes, so rule two. So here we have three terms, right? And then um, as long as we can show that this is a kernel, it gets pre and post multiplied by essentially the same expression here in terms of x and here in terms of x prime. So this corresponds exactly to rule two. Okay, very good. So, so we're now ready to um, write the justification. So in fact, um, where we need to start is um, we can use rule eight, where if I replace A by the identity matrix, I can just show that x transpose x prime is uh, a valid kernel. So x transpose x prime is a valid kernel by rule eight when A is equal to I, okay? Then we can show that x transpose x prime divided by um, sigma square is a valid kernel by rule, I believe it was rule one. Then we can have the exponential of that, so e to the x transpose x prime divided by sigma square is a valid kernel by rule four. And then finally, k of x, x prime is a valid kernel by rule two. Okay, any questions regarding this? Yes? Uh, for the second rule, is there some limit uh, on the function f? Like you could just set f to be negative one. Uh, oh, never mind, the two f's are the same. Yeah, so here, um, f can be anything. And yeah, it's tempting to introduce a negative function here, like minus one but then it will get multiplied again by minus one. Yeah, I so, I yeah, no, so, so yeah, this rule is, is quite interesting. Um, and, uh, but in any case, um, yeah, it, it, it works. So I guess the intuition is that kernels are positive semi-definite function. If you're a little bit familiar with linear algebra, 
positive semi-definite matrix is always of the type where you have a decomposition in terms of a matrix transpose times itself. So here, this is essentially like F, you can think of it as like a matrix uh, times itself. And, and here, the X versus the X prime is like the transpose versus not the transpose, okay? That's, that's the intuition. So, so basically, you can always decompose a kernel to be like a function uh, times the same function again. Um, that's uh, now in terms of the other variable, X prime. Okay, any other questions? Okay, very, oh, yes, one more. Okay, yeah, so the benefit of taking our polynomial kernels and writing it down this way, here this was essentially just an exercise to show what is the implicit feature space, okay? So like let's say that we wanted to um, construct a function that is a polynomial function up to some degree m, right? Then um, if we if we want to do this using tools of linear algebra, do linear regression, right, then we would have to essentially come up with all the, uh, the features, all the monomials up to degree m. So it would correspond essentially to all of these things. And then we would pay a price in the sense that the dimensionality would be exponential in m, uh, but then we would be able to do our linear regression, which would implicitly correspond to some sort of polynomial regression. But now, you see, by working directly with the kernel here, we can compute all the entries, all the similarity measures between every pair of data point x and x prime, and that's all we really need in order to do um, generalized linear regression or whether it's classification. So we're going to see next some techniques that will utilize the kernel directly so that we obtain um, some computation that doesn't depend on the dimensionality of, of the new space. So that's the benefit. So we were just showing the dimensionality of the new space, but we're still going to use the original analysis to find the actual computation. Exactly, yeah. So, so here, yeah, this is just for illustration purposes, we're not going to work with this, right? This is just to illustrate what this corresponds to, right? Because it's not obvious when I write this, right? What's the corresponding feature space? It's, it's, it's not obvious, so we have to do the derivation. This illustrates that. And now, uh, if I come back to the Gaussian kernel, So the Gaussian kernel here, I'm claiming that it has an infinite feature space. Okay, so if you try to do a similar derivation as this, right, you're going to end up with a vector that is going to be infinitely long. And in fact, in assignment three, you need to prove this. Um, and this makes the Gaussian kernel quite powerful because if you'd like to uh, span some function and you have a large number of basis functions, there's a better chance that your function is in that space. Now, if, this, if your set of basis functions is infinite, right, then, I mean, you can't, you can't get any better than that, right? So, so you will have a very expressive, a very large number of basis functions, and now you can represent, presumably, arbitrary functions. And the beauty is that we're going to be able to do this without paying a price computationally. Okay, any other questions? All right, so let's continue. Okay, so I've talked about kernels um, that are defined with respect to vectors so far. Um, so very often in a lot of problems, our data is in terms of vectors, but then in many other problems, the data is not a vector, at least not in its most natural form. So if we think of sets or strings or graphs, these are other types of objects that we might want to work with. In particular, 
Strings occur very frequently in natural language processing. If you take a document, that is a string of words, or if you take a sentence, that's a string of words. And then, so, a lot of interesting questions in natural language processing, like document classification, right, then we would like to do this with respect to strings of words. And now today the modern approach is to take a document and embed that into a feature space, not necessarily using these techniques, but then um, there, there was already this idea uh, several years ago in terms of um, uh, mapping strings and, and in fact documents um, using some notion of kernels. So in particular, what if we want to define a kernel that would measure the similarity between two documents as the weighted sum of all the non-contiguous strings that appear in both documents D1 and D2. Okay, so if you want to compare two documents, the most natural thing to do is to compare their substrings. And perhaps, you know, the simplest could just be to say, let's compare the words that they have in common and maybe count this. Something a little more general could be, let's consider uh, some subsequences of words that are in common, count that as well. And then even more general could be, let's consider some subsequences that are non-contiguous. So in other words, I could have like a word and then something that doesn't match and then another word, right? So this could be a subsequence that is not contiguous. And then if I've got that in common into two different documents, then perhaps they're more similar, right? So if we could consider like this, all the subsequences that are not contiguous, this could be quite powerful. But then when you start thinking about all of these features, all the substrings, all the subsequences that are not contiguous, there's a lot of them, right? This is going to take uh, too much time, too much space to enumerate. So we need a kernel or we need uh, some trick to essentially work with this so that we don't have to pay the price of enumerating all these features. And this is where we can define non-vectorial kernels for that purpose. So in particular, there's a paper that was published uh, in 2002 on test classification using string kernels that explains how to do this. So let me go to this paper. Okay, so in this paper, they, um, they consider uh, strings, and here they do it at the character level. So when I talked about documents, I said we could have strings of words, but more generally speaking, because words, um, we used to think that it was a finite number of them that are part of the dictionary, but today with social media, people are inventing new words all the time, or otherwise people, uh, when they type their words, there might be typos and so on. So uh, what is now becoming popular is to consider documents or words or, or sentences uh, as a s string of characters. Okay, so if we think of this as a, a string, some, some strings of characters, then, yeah, let me make this a little bit bigger. Oops. Um, okay, so I've got here some words, cat, car, bat, and bar. And um, I've got here some substrings that are not necessarily contiguous. So here I'm looking at substrings of size two, of length two, so C, A, C, T, A, T, B, A, B, T, C, R, A, R, and B, R. Okay, and now I'm gonna map every word so more generally speaking, it could be every sentence, or otherwise every document, so any string. I can map it into a new feature space that would correspond to whether that uh, string contains as a substring, a subsequence, CA. And then if, if the answer is yes, there's going to be a non-zero value. And then if the answer is no, there's a zero value. Okay, so for every subsequence, I'm gonna have a corresponding feature, and then when I apply my mapping phi, then it's going to return zero if um, the subsequence is not present, 
and then something else that is positive if the sequence is present. Now when it returns something that is positive, here the idea is that we're going to take um, a value lambda, typically lambda is going to be between 0 and 1, and then we're going to raise that to some power, which will have the effect that the higher the power is, the smaller the value is. And here the power is going to reflect how long in the original string uh, does it take to find that substring. So for instance, in cat, we have CA, that's uh, essentially a substring of size 2, so I'm going to have lambda raised to the power of 2. But then CT is also present, but now we need to look at a, a string of size 3 to find CT, and therefore I'm going to raise that to a power of 3. So here the intuition is that if I find the substring and then there's no gap and then you know it is, it is a shorter substring, then it's, it's, a, it's a more important match, right? Whereas if I have some gaps and it's not contiguous, then the substring is maybe not as important and I want to give it a lower weight. So that's why the power is going to be higher and that's why here we have lambda to the 3. Okay, so this gives you the embedding, if we look at any substring of size 2, so I've got all of them here, and then whether they're present or not uh, for these different words. And obviously here these are very short words, just size 3, we're looking only at substrings of size 2, but you could do this at the level of a document, okay, and this is what this paper does. Now if we want to know um, how similar two words are, then we could take the dot product of their embedding. Uh, so here, for instance, um, the kernel of car and cat will be the dot product of the first row by the second row. And then they only have one feature in common, so it will be lambda, uh, lambda square times lambda square, which uh, gives um, lambda 4. Okay, So that's what we obtain here lambda 4. Okay, any questions regarding this example? Yes? How did we decide on columns? Is it, is it just, is it not, is it zero for everything else and we didn't write the other columns? Like right, okay, so here for, for the column what I did is I simply enumerated all the substrings of, of length 2 that are present in those four words, but obviously in practice you'd want to take essentially every pair of characters from the alphabet and perhaps even including numbers and other symbols that are possible. Yeah. Okay. Alright, so now um, if we want to come up with a kernel um, that computes this efficiently. Well, the natural way of computing the kernel is shown here where we have um, the definition. So the kernel in the feature space is, is, is just the dot product. So this is what this shows here. But then doing this computation is going to take exponential time, right? Because there's so many features, so many substrings that it takes too long. So instead, what the paper proposes is to compute the kernel kind of gradually. So here they define another function, k prime i. So it's essentially the computation for uh, substrings up to length i, and then they essentially increase i up to the length that we want. Let's say it's length n that we want, so they just increase this gradually. And then they do this by dynamic programming. So when they do this by dynamic programming, then they have some recursive computation here. I'm not going to go over the details, but basically um, this allows them to compute those kernels in linear time with respect to the length of um, uh, x and x prime, as well as the length of the substrings uh, as features that they want to consider. So if, if they were not doing dynamic programming, it would be exponential, whereas now they can boil it down to something that is linear and, and computationally tractable. 
Okay, and then the paper uses this in the context of support vector machines, and then they uh, do document classification um, using some news articles from routers. So they've got um, different um, categories or classification, and then they show some results here. Um, let's not worry about the numbers in this table. The bottom line is that um, they're doing classification using support vector machines. That's a technique we're going to see next class. And um, support vector machines can be used with um, uh, kernels, and then that's what they leverage here. Okay, so it allows them to work in a much richer space, and this can be quite powerful. <coughs> okay, any questions regarding this example? All right, very good.